in advance. Some of this is going to be red because I just got out of the field two days ago. Um, but I'll begin. Today I'll be presenting a summary of the results of a portion of my PhD titled Subsistence Practices in the Arid Negev Highlands During the Intermediate Bronze Age. I understand that most of this probably means nothing to you, so I'll start with a short background. Anyway, to understand the Intermediate Bronze Age, we first need to look at the preceding period, the Early Bronze Age 2-3. Um, the EB is a very interesting period in time because it's the first experiment in the Southern Levant with urbanism and regional power structures. Uh, the most powerful entity during this time is the Old Kingdom of Egypt. And this is the beginning of the unification of North and South and this kind of thing happening here. To the north of the area, we have Syrian urban sphere. And in the center, we have a Canaanite urban sphere that is starting to coalesce. At the same time, we have copper mines to the east in modern-day Jordan that are being exploited. And in between, we have these marginal sediments in arid sites, which will be the focus of this study. Now, during this period, we have evidence for heavy trading continuing connecting the copper mines also to the Old Kingdom and throughout all the urban areas and the maritime, uh, and as including maritime trade. Now, focusing now on the intermediate period, this is when things change. Egypt reaches new levels of prosperity. For reference, this period is the time that corresponds to the construction of the pyramids at Giza. In the north, Syrian uh, cities expand and become more powerful. But in the center, we have this kind of situation that is confusing where we have this deurbanization and ruralization. At the same time, copper mines are still being uh, exploited in the east, and the margin settlement sites are expanding. Trade is still continuing in the area, but now, for some reason, maritime trade is no longer following the coast, but actually going from directly from the Old Kingdom to the Syrian area. So there's a big change in the center here, including the expansion of these sites, the deurbanization, and this will be the focus of our, my research. Um, basically, the purpose of my research is to explore this kind of increase in the arid sites, uh, specifically in the Negev Highlands, using reconstructed subsistence strategies as a proxy for settlement trends. In other words, what exactly does this new settlement represent? Is it changing political structures? Does it have to do with what's going on in Egypt, in the Syrian urban cities? Does it have to do with deurbanization and realization of stuff going on uh, in the Canaanite area? Or is this something different? Is this nomadization of urban people, uh, formerly urban people? Is this uh, sedentation of pastoral nomads in arid environments now that there's unsafe areas? These are the larger questions that will be kind of looked at. This is just one part of a larger program where we have studied uh, settlement oscillations in this arid environment over the long durée. So previously we did areas uh, involved with the Iron Age, early Islamic, Byzantine era, these kind of situations. Now focusing into what I'm going to be talking about today, we have in this kind of expanding um, settlement system, we have two types of sites. We have large sites which are ex kind of uh, this is a good example here. This is Masha Besa Day. You can see that it's quite a large site. These are new. These never exist before or any time after in the Negev Highlands. In comparison, we have these kind of small sites. They're much smaller, and traditionally these are connected to nomadic, probably agro-pastoralists, and these ones are more con uh, considered to be sedentary agro-pastoralists or somehow related to the copper production. So these were the big ideas that we wanted to check. Um, because these are big assumptions based on no direct evidence for any sort of any sort. No idea of copper production, animal rearing, or cereal agriculture has been identified in previous excavations of either of these types of sites. So we went in looking at mainly subsistence strategies, livestock rearing, for example, how we could identify this. And this, we are looking at it through identification of dung deposits at sites. Uh, two, we have dry farming. We, can, we are also looking at this through dung deposits as a proxy uh, if these animals are eating agricultural byproducts. And three, we were looking at copper processing or production, which uh, we hope to find in ash features and fire features. Beyond subsistence, we also wanted to ha understand the time component. What are these sites? Are, these, are they contemporary? Is there some kind of sequence? Is there different phasing in this period? 
Um, is there any sort of stratigraphic or horizontal development of sites? This has recently been published elsewhere, so I won't get too much in the chronology, but I'll briefly mention it in a few slides. Anyway, over the course of this research, we basically used three main um, geoarchaeological methods. We used micro-remain quantifications and morphologies in the case of phytoliths, uh, specifically to identify dung context and also ash features. We used FTIR for mineral, mineral characterization, micromorphology to understand depositional history of archaeological context, and to identify copper production or processing, we used XRF, uh, not in the field, but uh, in the lab after excavation. At the same time, we did a uh, few dating schemes, including radiocarbon and OSL at the sites, to understand kind of the what I was talking about before, the horizontal or, horizontal or vertical stratigraphy. Anyway, we chose four sites to do large-scale case studies at. We chose two large sites, uh, Masha Besa Day and Enzik. You can see them labeled here in the orange. Oops, wrong computer. Orange. And two smaller sites, Nahalbuker and Nahalnitsana 332. Now, these are in the same kind of area, uh, roughly, um, where they have about the same rainfall, but they are in different microenvironments. We have different geology and different other things that we wanted to control. We wanted to associate the subsistence practices with a type of site rather than something, or to see if it's related to a type of site or if it's related to something more general, more something to do directly with the environment. We did, uh, here's just a brief showing of our C14 results. At Enzik, we have nine dates. They came in a very short range between 2500 and 2200 BC. This fits in the first stages of the Intermediate Bronze Age, um, which is very interesting. And then at a smaller site, at Nahabokir, we have nine dates also. They give us a much larger range. So we can already see from the chronology that there's some kind of continuation of one pattern and the formation of a new kind of settlement type in the Negev. This is something that was unclear before this study. Now, to give you the results of the first site we excavated, this is Mashabe Sade. We excavated 16 loci uh, in both structures and open areas uh, across the two um, ridges over the saddle. Um, we took uh, 32 sediment samples from the area. We took much more, but 32 samples from archaeological context. And we analyzed them for phytolith concentrations and Douglas fairy like concentrations. Now in this graph, you can see quite clearly that the first thing, it's immediately apparent how low the control quantifications are down here. And that there is only a minor elevation in surface areas and also floors in archaeological contexts. Only in ash area layers do we have really high concentrations of phytoliths. At the same time, Dung's fairy light concentrations are extremely low in all areas, which is something we didn't expect. We expected there to be animals somewhere in some of our excavated areas. So this area, we were basically, at least primary, preliminary, we were saying that there is no dung at these sites and that these two regions are, must be supported by something else. We also did XRF in certain ash contexts and we found no elevations in copper or any kind of other metallurgical byproduct minerals, iron, silicon, manganese, these sorts of objects. So we're kind of left with a mystery here. What was this? If there's no animals at these sites uh, over across a large exposure, what's going on here? And we have maybe no uh, production of copper. What's really happening? Now, looking at the material culture, we basically, in the pottery, we had pottery. We had uh, storage vessels mainly, about 60%. We had copper. We had red seashells, so we can see some kind of trading systems coming out. And we had a, quite a good deal of lithics, but indeed we had no evidence of sickle blades, which should be indicative of some kind of agricultural activity. Now for the second site, uh, we wanted to look at uh, this uh, site that maybe had better preservation. We first thought this had to be a preservation issue, maybe because Dung's fairy lights or calcitic micro remains that uh, flash flood or something washed them all away. So we went to a different site, a, a more lowland site um, on an alluvial terrace where we were hoping that the, the fact that the sites were not built on bedrock might give us a better opportunity for preservation of micro remains. 
So we excavated here five different areas. Um, six structures, six open areas, about 75 square meters, so it's quite a large excavation. We took 82 sediment samples from across the terraces and across the areas, and actually, surprisingly, we got the same kind of picture. What we saw is phytolith concentrations are only really elevated in outdoor surfaces, a little bit in floor context within structures, but mainly in ash deposits and hearths. Again, dung's fairy-like contexts were absolutely, I mean, dung's fairy-like concentrations were basically non-existent across the board. So again, in a larger site where we think that we have good preservation, we again see the same kind of pattern. So again, no dung, what's going on here? In this site, we did a much larger XRF study on all of the ash features that we found. And again, we found no evidence of enrichment of copper or any kind of metallurgical activity. So at this point, we were basically pretty secure that the idea of copper production being per space persuasive, controlling the formation of these sites, maybe doesn't have anything. And also, oddly, there's no animals here. So what's going on? Material cultural, again, we have the same pattern that we have at uh, Masha Base today. We have pottery, mainly storage vessels, copper, lithics, and very few animal bones. So to give a quick summary of the two sites, here they are in comparison. We basically have no evidence for dung at either of the sites. In the smaller study at Masha Base today and the much larger one at Enzik, there's no context with animal dung in any site. We have ash deposits at both sites, both in secondary and uh, in situ um, contexts. But again, according to XRF, neither, none of these can be associated with copper processing, although we do have evidence of copper items, including ingots, items, and scrap. So copper is traveling through here, but there is nothing happening in these sites. Ceramics, again, as I said, sorry, I switched the percentages, but storage, clearly dominates the assemblages of both of these. And cooking and domestic, other domestic uh, uh, forms are much, much lower. So we decided that the most logical thing, if we have no animals, we have trade items coming through, that these, these sites must be supported primarily by trade, and they must have no evidence, they have uh, no connection to direct food production. Now to check our results and make sure that we weren't just making a big crazy idea out of nothing, we looked at small ephemeral sites in comparison. Now these have always been assumed to be uh, kind of pastoral nomadism places. So we started off with Nahal Care. We excavated 12 loci, small probes one to two meters across the site, and we took about seven, 60 sediment samples. Now what you can immediately see here brown equals dung, uh, that we have a dung signal showing up quite uh, strongly in many of the archaeological contexts. I want to point out here that the concentrations are different. In this uh, side, we have the phytoliths plotted, and on this side, we have dung spherulites. Now, I don't know about how many of you have done ethnographic studies on archaeological dung, but if you're doing quantifications of um, dung spherulites, these are the levels that you hit in modern-day dung. So we can say here that in Nahal Boker, where we do have a good presence of dung, the preservation is very, very exceptional. Anyway, these are the dung contexts. You can see they take up the majority of the site. And also what's interesting is it highlights that there is different use of space. We have different use of space in this room here, room four, and also in a structure that, honestly, I was too lazy to draw here, and a um, <laughs> uh, rectangular structure to the side where we might have a few cultic objects showing up. So we can see that there is a differentiation in use of space, and interestingly, there's either exceptional cleaning or there's a maintenance of this over long periods of time, which is very interesting on a kind of anthropological level. Anyway, in the dung context, I also did phytolith uh, morphologies, and basically all dung contexts are dominated by woody phytoliths. We were looking here to see if we could identify seasonal variations or anything with increased concentrations over time in, in uh, you know, phytoliths indicative of cere um, not cereals, excuse me, uh, grasses, but we found nothing. These are heavily dominated by woody phytoliths, and we have no phytoliths indicative of cereals at all. Material culture here is the exact opposite of what we see at uh, Enzik and Masha Besa Day, where we have pottery, mainly cooking vessels dominating the assemblage, and again, very few animal bones. 
Now for the final site that we looked at, we uh, recently in April, we excavated two small sites in the same area um, as kind of like a control, and we wanted to do a more spatial analysis. So we gridded them up. So far, I've only analyzed parts of this structure here and this area here. And what we had is we, in this area, we have 35 square meters exposed, five minutes. We, I've done about 20 of the 16 samples in these three areas. We have an outside area, inside a structure, and in an open courtyard. And what we saw, again, is that there is differentiation of space. Outside, no animal activity. Inside, a uh, slight animal activity. Maybe it's being dragged in or something. And outside in the open courtyard, we have heavy animal activity, or at least heavy preservation of animal activity. So to go through quickly the summary, at these sites, yes, we have dung. We have animal dung in large courtyards covering the site, super obvious. Ash, we have ash in certain areas. Again, here we have no indicative, uh, we have no material that is related to copper or anything. So uh, we didn't actually even process XRF because uh, there seemed no point. Ceramic storage was uh, rather low, and cooking vessels, at least in the Hubble Care, were quite high, almost 50%. Now, Honestly, I can say something very strongly. I think we have evidence here of clear pastoralism. We have no evidence of agricultural activity, according to the phytolith and lithic uh, assemblages. And Nahalnitsana seems to be reflecting the same kind of idea, although I still have more work to do. Moving on. So during this period, interestingly, we have two very different uh, settlement types. We have small sites reflecting pastoralism, and large sites, which are basically microarchaeologically micro empty, and the only thing that we can reconstruct here is some kind of trading system supporting this. <coughs> we have no evidence for copper production. These are both contemporaneous, but large sites are new. They are something different that changes with the onset of the Intermediate Bronze Age. Broad implications, maybe the trading trend, uh, trade routes is actually the impetus for this uh, development in the arid settlements. And this is kind of like where the future of our investigations will be exploring. Thank you. <laughs>